Buongiorno, my name is Elman Ainsworth. Today I'm really excited to be interviewing Guy Grassi. Guy is the culinary godfather of Melbourne. He's been in business since 1987. His father was a chef, he's a chef. His two kids are a chef now working in his business as well. Guy's gonna to talk to us about all the lessons he's learned and the experience he's had in his long successful career in Melbourne's hospitality industry. Guy's definitely at the forefront and leading the industry trends and the face of it. He's run some of the most successful restaurants and continues to run. The one we're in now is Grassi Florentino, which has been in business since 1928. Guy's a leading person in this industry, and I'm very excited to learn from what he has to teach us today in this interview. So thank you again for tuning in. Buongiorno. Buongiorno, Salman. Shalom. Ben benvenuto. <laughs> Lovely to have you here. Thank you for having us. I appreciate it. Uh, Guy, you are the culinary godfather of Melbourne. You're very kind. You opened your first restaurant in 1987? Correct. In Armadale? What was that called? It was called Quadri. It was Quadri? a small little 50-seater restaurant. Um, I opened it up with my wife, Melissa. Um, and we were very green, very raw, very young as well. So we did a lot of learning as we went along. Did you make any money on the way? Uh, we actually did make money, surprisingly enough, out of that little restaurant. We, it was a BYO restaurant. Um, the overheads were very low and we worked at all ourselves. Um, because it was a very small restaurant, um, it didn't take as much um, personnel to run as maybe a larger restaurant. And also the wages were very different back then um, and the, the whole, all the compliance was very different back then. Um, we did make a few mistakes along the way, but we got quite busy very quickly. So we were able to actually um, put some funding into the bank, which helped us get our next business up and running. And then you bought Florentino. No, we went to Cafe Grossi, which was in um, Turak Road, it's it in Clarence Street, just off Turak Road in, um, in South Yarra. And we were there for 15 or 16 years actually, and I went into that with my father, Pietro Grossi, who was a chef as well, prominent chef who came to Melbourne in 1960 wow. from, from Milan. Um, so as you can see, we're, you know, the Grossi brand in Melbourne as a food family has been around for a long, long time, a lot longer than what many, other, many people think because Dad got here in 1960 and was cooking ever since. Um, Florentino, where we're sitting today, was actually one of the first places the boys took Dad on a, on a break from his, um, from his work through the day because he was working around the corner at a restaurant there called Mario's Hotel, which was on Exhibition Street, yeah. very famous big time restaurant of the day. And when did you take on Florentino? That was, we bought this uh, 22 years ago um, from Lorraine Podgenick. Lorraine um, had inherited the business from Floyd Podgenick, who bought it from Branco. Um, and he had a, a, a bad demise, um, he committed suicide. Um, and so his widow inherited the restaurant, Lorraine, and she ran it for about 10 years. Um, then I heard that she was thinking of selling. Um, we always had a, a fascination for Florentino and a very soft um, place in our heart as a family for Florentino. It's a, like a bastion of Italian restaurant that's been around since 1928. So, 1928 in this location? In this location, yeah. The first restaurant in this location was Cafe de Nat, which was opened by um, Samuel Wynne. Um, famous uh, for Wynn's Wines, and um, his name was actually Shlomo. He had it changed to Samuel to make it sound more anglicised. Um, but it was in this very room that Café Denart was born. This was the room that Samuel's um, children were born, uh, his family home, and he bought a restaurant called Café Denart around the corner. And in um, 1918, he moved it into these rooms here. In 1928, um, Ronaldo Massoni purchased the leasehold from Samuel. Um, and um, in 1935, they went next door into the mural room um, and the cellar bar was always a bar downstairs. In the 1950s, they added the grill restaurant um, down, down there as well. So it's got a fantastic tapestry, um, a colourful tapestry of history, this actual building. Um, and it hasn't had that many owners. After Ronaldo, there was George Sindos, then there was Branco, Lorraine, and now us. And we feel like custodians of the place because it really is the guests that come here every day who own it metaf metaphorically, but also who keep the, um, the wheels of the business turning because as you know, without enough guests, you know, it's, um, they provide your cash flow. It's like the blood through the veins of a business. Florentino is Burke Street. 
Well, it's, it's part of the fabric. Yeah, I'd like to think so. It's, yeah. um, it has, um, you know, a great history and it's watched Melbourne grow. If you could sta stand it, if it, you know, it had eyes and you stood at the front door um, since 1928, watching Melbourne change in fast forward, you would see this amazing growth of a city that's grown into what you could say is a 24 hour cosmopolitan city. Sure. Of course, we've had a little slap in the face in the last 12 months or so, but I'm glad to report that I can, I feel quietly confident again. I feel that it's happening again, Zelman. We, the, the people are coming out and they want to look after themselves. They want to enjoy Melbourne. Um, and I think as Victorians, we're very resilient people and we're very proud of our city mm -hmm. and our state. Um, and in particular, this beautiful city that, mm -hmm. you know, my parents came to in 1960 and, you know, we would have it as a family n no other way because mm -hmm. we're very proud to be here. So out of your long, lustrous career in hospitality in Melbourne, what is the one biggest change you've experienced? Well, I think from a hospitality point of view, um, the biggest thing is um, the cost of running businesses as far as employment goes. That's really big, compliance. There's lots more compliance now than there ever was before. Um, and now with this new layer of compliance that we've had with COVID, that's another big change. So I think, you know, you really need to be aware of all these things happening because they all add cost. They add en energy that needs to be spent on them. So you've got to actually become efficient in other areas so that you can actually do that and comply and comply we will because the, the the easiest way to get around compliance is to just do it you know that's the easiest way to do it because if you're sort of starting to cut corners and so forth and this is what i tell my team it, it becomes harder to manage cutting the corners than it does actually just do the thing properly and you know you're going to go to sleep say um well at night you know yeah. So the city of Melbourne is very proud of the culinary precinct and culture and reputation that we have on a global standard. As a council, what can the city of Melbourne do to maintain that presence and that success and that drive and then growth into the future for the culinary precinct of Melbourne? Sure. Well, let me just say that what the city um, of Melbourne has done for us through this very, very difficult time has been outstanding. Um, they've helped us to improve our outside areas, which I think has added a real, um, especially to our restaurant, a real a piazza, Italian type feel. Yeah. It's, a, it's a vibrant type of energy that, that they've added by, by helping us do all that. Um, and they've done that at, at you know, very, very low, if no cost to us which has been great that they've been so helpful. Um, they've also eased up on, on certain you know, permits and things like that, which has been very helpful as well. Um, I think that they need to be doing more of what they have been doing, just encouraging businesses to actually open up more and do more business um, without putting hindrance on them. And, and that is what they've been doing. Into the future, I think more festivals, I think more celebration in the city, using the city um, like European cities um, to celebrate, you know, the, the coming of a new new season, um, or being creative in that sense, um, really good marketing to, to, you know, combat, you know, the whole notion of people not coming back to the city, which is ridiculous because if, you, if your city doesn't thrive, then God help the suburbs. Agreed. Are you enjoying this outdoor dining and do you think it's something that should stay into the winter? Zelman, we've always had an outdoor dining area. Um, if you tell me, is that a replacement for indoor dining? The answer is absolutely not. It can, that it, one has to work with the other. But yes, we celebrate the outside dining area because, you know, we're, we're from Melbourne. We, we go to the footy when it's two degrees and, and we cheer for our side to win, you know. So, you know, it takes a, it takes a lot of bad weather to get us off, off the streets and enjoying the fresh air. But um, having said that, it needs to work in conjunction with your inside dining as well. It, one cannot replace the other. Are you going to make those weather protected now? Uh, we're looking at doing different options. Yeah, we are, definitely. Yeah. Who around the world is doing it well at the moment, outdoor dining? Well, I think um, I think Europeans have always done it very well. I mean, if you look at some of those cafes um, in Venice and Piazza yeah. San Marco, areas like that, even um, Piazza Bra, in, you know, places like that, uh, Milan, you know, they've always done it very, very well. Um, moving into home delivery, last year we mm -hmm. saw a lot of premium restaurants. Yep. Um, taking their restaurant experience into people's homes mm -hmm. and basically making restaurants online. Is that something that you believe in and do you think that's a business that's here to stay? Well, let me just say that we developed a brand called Grossi Akaza during the shutdown period. Yeah. We, were f we had to do that because we had absolutely no income 
coming in from the restaurant because we were shut down. So we ummed and out and walked, you know, scratch our heads for a little bit. And then my daughter, Loredana, got busy on, the, on building the website. We had great help from people like Mark Chu, our photographer, who came and photographed the food for our website and made it look stunning. Um, and we actually got back some turnover, which saved the family. If we hadn't have had that, and good partners as well, I have to shout out to our amazing suppliers, you know, people like Clams, Angelo Flute, Fruit Addiction, um, you know, Metropolitan, many, many others. They were just so understanding um, and so they looked after us very well. Um, we had good bankers, you know, so we were able to get through. But if we didn't have the Grossia Casa turnover, I, I hate to think what would have happened. Will home delivery or Grossia Casa ever replace a dining experience in a restaurant? The answer is no to that, Zelman, because we go to restaurants to be seduced. We go to restaurants for a holistic, hedonistic experience, whether it's a very low level cafe offer, we still want to feel like we're out and about with people amongst others and enjoying the whole experience. It's not just about having food and sustenance, but it has created a new marketplace, that's for sure, because now we've got restaurants that have this service that deliver really lovely food at home. So if you were to be um, dining at home or entertaining at home with some friends, why not give them a flower drum experience or give them a grossier casa experience or give them a maha experience or something like that, you know, because now you have all these other options available to you. But it will not replace the feeling of being amongst people in a restaurant or being served upon in a restaurant, that whole experience. But on the restaurant experience though, staffing seems to be the biggest issue in the industry. Are you finding that as well? Absolutely, look, we, it's never been more difficult. I mean, restaurateurs have been- Is that because the borders are closed? Uh, it's because a lot of our internationals have gone. Um, they've gone, they've had to go home because yeah. through the long lockdown, a lot of the young people moved north, um, Aussies as well, um, because we were closed for so long. And a lot of the, um, the international workers have, have gone home and now they're not coming back. So um, we need to get immigration open again. We need to get the immigrant workers back because the hospitality industry really needs them. Um, and we are really struggling. I mean, restaurateurs have been notoriously known for whinging about not being able to get staff and not being able to get good staff. Well, let me tell you, it's not, a, it's not whinge worthy any longer. It's actual fact. It is really difficult, you know, you put an ad in the paper or you put an ad in the paper, you use the paper anymore, you put an ad on Seek or wherever you're trying to search for people and you get very little response. So the restaurant industry has changed a lot. Uh, costing has been the biggest issue that you've said. Um, what will the restaurants look like in five years from today and what are you doing now to plan for that change? Well, I think what we're doing is happening um, is happening by osmosis. We're finding efficiencies in the way we do things and what we do. Um, maybe where we had a small kitchen running and a larger kitchen running, you just do it out of the larger kitchen, you know, just things like that to try and make your operation more efficient and more streamlined. I think we're gone back to, well, not gone back to, but this has been evolving for a long time and I don't think it's just because of what's happened. I think it's, it's just fashionable um, to have look, focus more and more um, on primary product, you know, ingredients which are beautiful, um, well looked after, looking, um, researching and making sure you're buying locally as much as you can off great farmers, people that um, are like-minded and like looking after their produce and treating it with respect. So not too many layers, not too much intervention. And I think our food is going back to that sort of thing where it's more sort of earthy and, um, and tasty and real, you know, and I think that they're gonna be the changes that we're gonna see. I also see that people are celebrating and looking toward enjoying themselves. And I think the whole idea of the big city restaurant is back again. I think the idea of people um, coming out and having that big night out, that big celebration, whether it be over a, a bowl of pasta or, you know, a, a tasting menu that goes for, you know, two or three hours. It, that, that I believe is something that w is coming out of this, is gonna be popular again. Your kids are entering the business? They're in the business, well and truly entrenched. Carlo Grossi has released his first cookbook um, and um, you know, it was an ombre cookbook. Uh, Loredana is in the business and she's, um, she's just amazing um, at what she does. They're both great hospitality front of house people but they have great other skills as well. It must, it's a beautiful legacy, third generation following. I feel fantastic. You know, I, I worked very hard through my younger years and through their formative years. So mum got to do everything with them, um, the good stuff and the bad stuff. 
and I was always at work, so now I get to spend a lot of time with my kids as young adults. Well, I'm not a young adult, but they are. <laughs> and, um, and I'm enjoying it immensely. Working with them has, has just been fantastic. And they also keep me young and fresh because they're, they're in with the know of what's going on in the industry. They've got their pulse on it, so it keeps me reinventing. And how do you manage that relationship as a father, business partner, business associate, all in one, and a work colleague? We've always been a family that have been have had very little separation between business, work, and the family home. On a Sunday lunch when we're eating together, we'll talk about the work, we'll talk about business, we'll talk about how we can improve something or what happened or what we could be doing. Um, and if somebody says at any point, we're always talking about work, let's talk about something else, the table goes quiet for a few minutes and then we start talking about work again. So it's, it's very little separation there. So it's, it's really been a very natural transition. And who cooks the Sunday lunch? Well, sometimes I do. I like to cook at home. I really do, surprisingly enough. I, I get a real kick out of cooking at home. Um, it's very different to cooking in the restaurant world, um, but, it's, but it's fun and it's good. But my wife is a wonderful cook as well, and a lot of times she might do it. And the kids do too. Like Laura Dunn is a great cook in the kitchen. She makes beautiful food, bakes great cakes, and Carlo loves to cook as well. So, so we share it. A lot of very high-density cities around the world, like Hong Kong, New York, and you know, all over Europe, they have multi-level restaurants where there's level one restaurants or basement restaurants or rooftop restaurants. We're starting to see that trend come to Melbourne. Actually, Sydney's quite progressed in it. Would you ever open a restaurant in a basement or in a level one? I don't see a problem with it. I think if you've got a concept that suits your premises and that suits the market, I think people will travel to you, whether you're up on the on the 80th floor or whether you're down in a basement, um, and sometimes down in a basement can be the, some of the coolest spaces I've seen. Um, we're on the first floor here, and as we were talking before, the restaurant's been here, Florentino's been here since 1928, so it's, it's gone through um, two world wars and now a pandemic, so I think, I think we'll be fine on the first floor, and I think if we're not, then maybe it's not the location so much, but maybe something else is wrong. Mm. Um, there's a lot of beautiful buildings in Melbourne, particularly in the CBD, that have level one completely vacant and have been vacant for decades. And we're now seeing landlords relook at their buildings to find out ways that they can add value and activate it. And seeing hospitality is obviously a key opportunity. Mm, yeah, I, I absolutely think that those beautiful buildings that you're talking about, and I know what the ones you're talking about, they should be activated. I often thought as a very young man, walking past and seeing those derelict, um, you know, first and second and third floors um, with broken windows, what an opportunity just waiting for something to happen. Landlords have done it tough and um, like everybody else, but a lot of restaurateurs or a lot of retailers don't realise how hard it's been for landlords um, because many landlords are not in a position to have given away as much as they have. Um, so, so I say thank you to our landlords that have helped us because we have had good landlords that have helped us. Um, but I also say to the landlords, be patient. It's better to have a good tenant that you like and that's been with you than to have to go out searching for other tenants um, and then you don't know what you're gonna get. It has been tough, but the help has been appreciated. And if you can get, if it's a partnership now. It's not us and them anymore, like it is with our team of people and our employees. It's not us and them. We have to break that out of the culture of our business and what we're doing. It's a team effort and we have to work together cohesively with our landlords. It's a partnership. We want our landlords to prosper, but we need to prosper along the way. And we want our team to prosper and they need the business to prosper as well. So it's a collective. And what would your message be to the industry, to your counterparts or colleagues in other major restaurants? We've been, we've been cohesive as a group. We've come together so well over this disaster and Let's keep that up because we've learned together along the, along the way here. We've, we've spoken to each other and for the first time in my career, we've actually lifted the veil on what I'm doing, what they're doing. We're all open and we're exchanging information. Everybody's talking to each other, which has been absolutely fantastic. You know, I mean, I've always had good friends in this, in this business, you know, Ronnie and, and Chris and, you know, Simon around the corner. There's they've always been good friends, but it's never been quite so open and cohesive as it is through this period. So let's keep that up because I think that's really helpful and worthwhile. It's a beautiful message. Guy Grassi, gracias. Prego, prego. prego.